I'm Evelyn, and I'm a geoholic. Dime, vamos para el mambo, no vamos para el mambo. Here we go. Here we go. Zumba. Zumba. I know that word. Hey. Hey. This is good stuff. Oh my gosh. How can you not love that? Right? I mean, how does that not get you going? Special request by one of our guests this evening. I love it. Love it. I I don't think we have any bad bunny on the playlist, so this is going to be good. I don't think. I think this is the inaugural Bad Bunny. I think you're right. I think you're right. Now's a good time to mention that if you were a guest on the Geoholics, you have input on the music. That is correct. That is used for that episode. And every single song from every single episode has been added to a playlist on Spotify, the Geoholics playlist. What is that up to now? Like 11 hours? Like 13 hours of music or something. And it's all really, really good music. Oh, yeah, of course. If you're on Spotify, make sure you go and you subscribe, I guess, or like or whatever the Geoholics playlist because it is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good stuff there. All right. Welcome back, Geoholics. Episode, we think, 185. 185. 185. And what do you hear the last episode that McKenna was my guest co host on? Oh, yeah. And I told her, I'm like, when I say the episode, you have to repeat it, just like Sean does. <laughs> 185. <laughs> she did, yeah. It is so funny. That's awesome. So funny. So anyways, dude, I feel like it's been forever since you it and I recorded together. It's been almost over a week. I know. It's That's like a, a long time for us. A part of me was missing. Yeah, there's definitely a KG void going on, I'm and now it is, it is being filled. Oh, I'm, yes, I feel whole again. How's that? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's very yeah. good. How was your, how was your vacation? You went to San Diego, right? Yeah. A little nice little week at the beach is nice. never a bad week. Awesome. Uh, every year we go with the same friends and it's always awesome. You know, yep. just good times all around. And it you is, don't want to come home, of course. It is hard to get You back. are still here. It is Thursday. You are still in vacation mode from last week. I oh, can absolutely. Tell. When you oh, walked in today, I'm like, you aren't, what? You gotta get dialed in here, buddy. Oh, uh, next week. <laughs> you got like a week vacation hangover. Yeah, I'll take that. That means it was a good one. Yeah, for sure. So, what's new with you, man? I haven't talked to mm. you in a little bit. Oh, well, um, what's new with me? Oh, I saw a really shitty concert last week. What, which one? We, I was super excited to see this show. We went and saw Big Head Todd and the Monsters. Oh, yeah, you're telling me about and it. Yeah. Blues Traveler. That's right. Yep. I'd never seen Blues Traveler. I was super excited to see him. I've heard nothing but good things. Uh, Megan had actually seen him before and said, great show, great show. I've seen him before, but it was when, you know, it was yeah. when they were popular. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, I mean, John Popper is a freaking legend on the harmonica yeah. oh, and yeah. everything, you know. So, man, I was so psyched. I had seen Big Head Todd and the Monsters. They opened up and they were fantastic. Fucking, uh, God, it was horrible. We left early. Um, that bad? It was the worst. John Popper, apparently, they played in Flagstaff the night before. Uh-huh. They didn't even show up for the show. What? They didn't even show up for the show. Like, he was sick or something like that, apparently. So, he walks out on stage, and he looks horrible. He's super thin now. Yeah, I saw um, that. Wears big, baggy shirts, you know, and he's just like, he's like, I'm thankful I'm here for you tonight. And I'm like, you know, what is going on here? And it's like, he could not get through a song without walking off the stage for like, five minutes literally while the band's just jamming he comes back he can hardly play the harmonica it was horrible i'm really? like what is going on here like everybody in the crowd is like what is happening like everybody was in shock on how bad it was like the entire like probably at least 50 percent of the people that were there walked out that is amazing it was like, bad it was uh, bad that's too bad unfortunately but uh, other than that life is good no complaints Good, 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 good. Um, quick Energio update. Yeah. Um, so the Geoholics officially will be at Energio in Berlin. The Geoholics are going international. We are. We are. We've kind of been once before. I was in Canada. Remember, I did some podcasting uh, up there. That's international. I don't count that. Oh, it's kind of international. What about Vegas? Is Vegas international? Feels like it, but it's not. It's not. No. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, uh, we will be in Berlin. October... I don't know. We'll be there for like nine days, but I think it's like the ninth through the twelfth. Uh, yeah, something I think it's tenth, like eleventh, and twelfth, something like something that. like that. But the cool thing is that Energio has given our listeners a voucher. We don't know exactly what it will do. <laughs> we don't know what this does. For there you. will be more information forthcoming. Yes, exactly. But this is the voucher number. It's supposed to be good. Well, by the time this episode comes out, it will definitely be active. Yes. So here is the voucher. We'll post it on our social media as well. But it's I G. Two three dash geoholics. So if you're attending Intergeo and you enter that code, you will get something amazing. I just don't know what it is. I just know it's <laughs> going to be amazing. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> 
Oh, man, we got a great show lined up tonight. Let's get on with this. Tell us about that opening number there, producer Sean. Okay, everybody knows this guy. Uh, He's a big, big deal. Bad Bunny. Después de la playa. That was pretty good. I had to try. Uh, Bad Bunny, whose real name is Benito Antonio Martinez Acasio, is a Puerto Rican singer, rapper, and songwriter who gained international fame for his contributions to Latin trap and reggaeton music. Hmm. He was born on March 10th, 1994 in Vega Baja, Puerto Rico. He throughout his career, Bad Bunny has remained authentic to his roots and has used his platform to address important topics, making him not only a music sensation, but a cultural icon. And I can yes. tell you before this whole Taylor Swift crazy thing on her tour. Yep. The year before that, when Bad Bunny came through town, mm-hmm. that was the biggest ticket, the hardest ticket to get. Sold out all crazy. the coliseums. The pe- the kids were paying crazy amounts for tickets. I mean, That's he's crazy. a big deal. He's a big deal. And I think he was actually, wasn't he like banging one of the Kardashians or something? Um, for a short time? Yeah. I mean, that, that list is getting extensive, but yeah. Like who hasn't? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, he, he he's he's very famous and very talented. He really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And our first bad ben, bad bunny request, I do believe. I do believe. So pretty excited about that. Um, moving on, we are in the Get Kids Into Survey Studio this evening. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about them. We will here in just a little bit. Um, and I do want to highlight that there is a West Coast Get Kids Into Survey. Um, franchise that our own Trent Keenan is a part of. And there are some unique sponsorship opportunities for the West Coast Get Kids Into Survey. And to find out more about that, you simply go to getkidsintosurvey.com forward slash USA dash West dash dash coast. So check out that website and you can check out all the really cool sponsorship opportunities that are now in the United States, West Coast specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are up Two, the Airworks random trivia. What do you got this week, Sean? Oh, uh, this is uh, probably going to be pretty relevant. Uh, four mm. ways BIM and AI are impacting the AEC industry. Uh, design optimization. BIM and AI are enabling design optim- optimization by enhancing the creativity, efficiency, and quality of the design process. Mm. Uh, construction automation. BIM and AI are enabling construction automation by enhancing the planning, coordination, and execution of the construction process. Uh, Facility management. Uh, They are enabling facility management by enhancing the operation, maintenance, and renovation of the building and project delivery. They are enabling project delivery by enhancing the communication, collaboration, and integration of stakeholders. Yeah, really good stuff. AI is definitely playing a bigger and bigger role in our industry. Oh, absolutely. We okay. talk about it a lot. We're going to continue to talk about it. And I, I think we're only opening the box there. I totally agree. It seems like every episode it's brought up in one way, shape or form. Oh, sure. I mean, it's affecting everything. Um, next up, we have the Advanced Geodetic Surveys, AGS, Weekly Words of Wisdom. Mm. So I mentioned last episode, I believe, that I'm reading a book. I'm sorry. I'm listening to a book called Bold, How to Go Big, Create Wealth, and Impact the World Okay. by uh, Peter Diamandis is the name of the author. And okay. It is fantastic. And this quote comes from that book, and I absolutely love it. There's an old saying in business. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Think about that. Put that into perspective. That is You are the average of the five people. You can include me if you want. I mean, you are are one of the five people I spend the most time with. So think about that, right? You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I mean, my kid is one of those five people too, so. Okay. All right. And your wife. Yeah. And me. And you. Yep. And a couple other randos. So how many of them are generates besides me? Uh, so you're the average of three degenerates, three degenerates your wife, and, and, my your wife and my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so a solid three fifth degenerate. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But yeah, I thought that was a really good quote. I like sure. that. Yep. All right. Let's get on with this. Our guests, we have a trio. Oh, yes. Us, sponsored by XYHT Magazine. Of course, I have to mention if you don't have your free subscription to XYHT Magazine, go to the website, XYHT dot com forward slash subscriptions i believe is a website it takes 30 seconds to sign up and you get a free subscription to xyht which is by far the best geospatial publication pops in your inbox yep absolutely 
So we have uh, Jennifer Triano with us with Topodot, Randy Allen with Topodot, and Josh Miller with David Evans and Associate. Well, I never heard of that group. Hmm. How's that? Hmm. Who are those guys? An interesting group. And there. I'm going to let them real quick do some real self, in, some real, some real quick self introductions. Yeah. Uh, just name, you know, who you're with, what you do, that type thing. So Jennifer, I'm going to let you go first. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Triana. I'm the business development director at Topodot. Um, I have been in the lighter industry for over 18 years, but I look very young for that, I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> I'm a mechanical engineer from UCF, um, and I started at Regal, so I um, started mm. at Regal about 18 years ago, so just, you know, working the hardware side of the lighter industry, and now I uh, have been with Tobodot since the very beginning, so the inception. Um, and that's been about 15 years or so. Wow. Wow. So were you, were you like employee number one? Um, I want to say employee number two, but probably <laughs> three because the developer comes first. Whatever. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And I, I got to tell you, we anywhere we go, any conference we go to, we see Jennifer there. Oh, yeah. She's <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. She is yeah. absolutely everywhere. She's almost like I, uh, uh, yeah, I am known like, for uh, as as Miss Topodot or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always handing out the best swag, just doing a great job promoting the product. Uh, Randy, you're up next, buddy. Uh, Randy Allen, been with uh, Topodot since March of this year, a director of training and support. Uh, yeah, <laughs> short and sweet. Yeah, yeah, Anything since else? March. Yeah, yeah, and a little bit about that. You were, you were, were you were a Topodot user for. Yeah. A super long time user. prior to that, yeah. right? Super yeah. user. Yeah, super user. I started in 2014 um, at my first uh, my first uh, employer in the industry, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's got awesome. To, got to learn the uh, the crew at Topodot. Got to uh, help uh, help them and on the production side of stuff, uh, and just became really good friends with them. So it was a natural natural fit for me to come on board. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. All right, Josh, you're up. Hello, my name is Josh Miller. I am a delivery leader for David Evans and Associates for the Mountain West region. Um, essentially, it's a regional manager. Um, my focus these days is to help facilitate training and coordinate work share um, amongst our regions um, at the company. Uh, it's got kind of a large group of people and we rely a lot on work share. As such, we we need to spend a lot of effort into coordination of that background and surveying for the last 23 years. Um, so I've been in the business a long time and um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a fairly proficient Tobodot user and I try to keep my hands in the mix all the time. Although I, I feel the pull to, to do less and less production work, but I'm still in it and I don't think I'll ever stop doing it. So um, yep. yeah. And Topodot's a great tool, of course. We're going to talk more about that. But before we do, we have to do the Trimble Pro Point Icebreaker. Ooh. We do this every episode. And uh, even with multiple guests, we're going to do this. This is going to be freaking hilarious. All right. Here's the, here's the icebreaker question this evening. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're going to start with Randy. Randy, what is your guilty pleasure as it pertains to food or snacks you ate as a kid Ooh. that you still find comfort in eating today? Well, uh, anyone that knows me, it's anything sweet chocolate cake pies but if you're on the inner circle my mm. guilty pleasure is fair food so oh. right now is the perfect time uh <laughs> with state fair up uh, yeah i mean if you can throw it in batter and deep fry it i'm going to eat it what is the most exotic <laughs> deep fried food that you have had Ooh, um well i don't know um have you done the, I mean, I've seen like deep fried Twinkies or Twinkies, Snickers Oreos, or something like that. Yeah. Or, oh, Twink, Oreos. Yeah. Twinkies, Oreos, cheesecake, which I did not like. Um, <laughs> cheesecake. Yeah. yeah. That's Just about funny. anything. Yeah. How about you, Josh? Got a couple. I mean, still absolutely love regular ramen noodle soup. Um, oh, yeah. Really? Can't okay. Wrong. Can't go wrong. I've never grown out of that. I still cook ramen all the time. I will try to church it up a little bit these days, but um, mm. I, you know, contrary to Randy's sweet tooth, I never had a sweet tooth. I'm more of a, a, a sour tooth. So pickles, 
I don't know if that's a guilty pleasure, but uh, I thoroughly enjoy pickles. I eat more pickles than candy by a ton. Interesting. Okay, right. Have you had uh, have you had deep fried pickles? Yeah, that's what uh, I was no, going to ask. Shy away from I shy oh, away yeah. from deep fried anything. I mean, I, I did have Rocky Mountain oysters once, which were deep fried. That was about it. So yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. Good stuff. How about you, Jennifer? Noodle soup. I'm, I'm quite which excited. Which one? Oh, pickles, <laughs> noodle soup. Yeah. Quite <laughs> Oh, man, ramen noodles. I lived on those suckers in college, no doubt about it. Uh, how about you, Jennifer? Well, I eat everything and anything. I love just trying out different foods wherever I go. My, um, I, I guess what I, what I really like every time that I go anywhere in the South is Southern food. So mm. uh, especially around New Orleans, I love jambalaya, yeah. gumbo. You know, it, those fried pickles, the uh, yep. fried green tomatoes. Uh, that's, oh, yeah. that's my guilty yep. pleasure, I should say. Yeah, mm -hmm. good stuff. How about you, Sean? As a kid, what did you eat as a kid that you still eat today? Uh, I mean, a lot of things. Uh, probably better list is what I don't eat anymore than I ate as a kid. But uh, I would say uh, Skittles yeah, good one. and uh, Domino's Pizza. Yeah, oh, yeah, can't go wrong. I mean, that's yeah. like when, you know, it's. A, I feel a little shameful eating an entire large pizza by myself, but when I've had a tough day and <laughs> I have to feed myself, it's it, it's what I go to. Yeah, yeah. What about you? No doubt. Um, for me, it's um, hot fries. Remember those Andy Cap hot fries? Oh, Remember yeah. those things? Little crispy, yeah. spicy little mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nuggets of I have no idea what it is. But I don't find the Andy Cap ones anymore. I find the like Chester Cheetos yeah, yeah. hot fries. And they're okay. just as good. Just right. as good. All right. Or like SpaghettiOs. SpaghettiOs. That's another thing. Out of the can? Out of the can. When you I was can, a kid. You can st <laughs> yeah. you still eat that today. Like you'll go to the grocery store and get a can of SpaghettiOs and eat it. Once in a great while. Once in a great while. Oh, just man. feeling the urge for some SpaghettiOs. All right. But anyways, all right, let's go. Uh, Jennifer, talk a little bit more about your role <laughs> at Topa Dot. Like I said, we see you everywhere. What exactly, um, how would you describe your role and what do you love about it? So um, so I started with Topa Dot in the training and, um, you know, the, uh, let's say the technical side, right? And so that, I, I love teaching. I've always loved connecting with my clients, just learning what they need, making them <coughs> successful. So over time, my role changed a little bit into uh, hosting talk, which we'll talk about talk a little bit in uh, so the users conference and organizing talk. Um, in, in the last, uh, I guess, two years, I started more into the business development side. So not just, you know, the sales role, but where can to without expand basically where where can we fit in in other industries and other types of applications and uh, that's that's pretty much my role and I enjoy it completely not only because I get to travel and meet a lot of people I love being um, at shows meeting people in person but also because you know every time that I somebody approaches me and says, oh, the is the best, or it's helped me out this way. It just gives me this sense of satisfaction because I, I pretty much, I, I own Tobo that in that regard, you know, I feel like yeah. it's, it's my baby too. So it's yep. very rewarding. Yeah, and I got to say, anytime that we run into Jennifer at conferences and stuff like that, I mean, always in a great mood, super mm -hmm. passionate about great promoting energy. the product, oh, yeah. awesome yeah. energy, the perfect person for that role, I guess is what I'm trying to say. How about you, Randy? You mentioned you you came over to Topodot just like four months ago. Prior to that, you were a what, super user, would you say? Uh, yeah, I was a uh, project manager with a, a uh, engineering surveying planning group. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Went into I went into production and worked, kind of worked my way up to the project manager role, um, and then I led a team of five to seven uh, technicians uh, mm -hmm. for for several years there uh, before coming over to Topodot. So now my my efforts every day are are um, directing the the new uh, training and support organization that they've put together as uh, Topodot has expanded uh, not only North America but actually globally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, one of our um, foundations has always been the, the support and training 
I enjoyed it whenever I was a client, you know, a, a user. Now, now I'm able to pay that back uh, by working in the company and providing the, the same level uh, of support and training to uh, our, our users. Mm -hmm. One thing I would say is uh, I, I was fortunate to be a tuck last year mm -hmm. uh, representing the Geoholics. And one thing I can say for sure is that everyone that I met that works for TopoDot has amazing energy, just like we were talking about, like Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, Randy, you've only been there for four months, but there definitely seems to be a culture within the within the group. How would you explain that? They're, they're very passionate uh, about uh, not only the software, but uh, ensuring that the users uh, know how to use the software. And, and um, they're passionate about listening to the users. You know, we, we're always got our ear to our clients and, uh, and trying to um, be the solution them so mm -hmm. when, they, when they've got a problem so yeah uh, you can definitely feel the passion yeah it seems pretty infectious for sure it is, uh, so i gotta ask real quick go for it do you, do you get like a plaque to become a super user like how do you <laughs> go from user to super user mm -hmm. like is uh, that a designation or well you, you is, get, it, is it self-assigned you <laughs> <laughs> you get the ear of the uh head engineer that writes all the code and you, you call him every day and bug him every day <laughs> and, and you beat him up to create tools or enhance tools uh and finally they just give you something to just shut you up a little bit so so it's but, like super <laughs> user <laughs> aka pain in the ass. Pain in my <laughs> uh, i think it actually at i think actually at tuck i did get recognized for the most requests for enhancements Ooh. and new tools or something it was it was just like a generic uh, uh, trophy gift or something. I it was it was it was funny. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So I gotta like, say that it's gotta be it's gotta be something valid. It cannot be random things. Please don't <laughs> don't fill our inbox. Right. right? Maurice is gonna yeah, kill us. Yeah. 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 So the, the topo but not. Folks were like, hey, if we yeah. can't appease him, we'll hire him. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, they had to hire some, so many more support people to handle the tickets from Randy that yeah. they just yeah. hired him. Exactly. Brought exactly. him in house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Josh, I'm, uh, let's bring you in here. Um, you actually presented at Tuck this, this year. Um, talk about that experience just a little bit. Well, it was uh, the first time I've ever given a presentation of, of that scale. Um, certainly to that many people so in that it was pretty nerve-wracking leading leading up to it um, I had been to tuck two previous conferences the year prior and then I think a few years prior um, and sort of started out as a beginner and then the next few years after I went again for the second time I was in the advanced track and then follow up to the uh, presenter level so so needless to say, I, I was pretty nervous, um, even though, you know, leading up to it, I had reviewed my presentation, and edited it, and tweaked it, and, <laughs> and felt like I was way behind the eight ball and thought everything was, all the, the bad things were going to happen, and then couldn't sleep, and then, you know, fly from Washington State all the way to Florida, and then, so all those things, I, I was kind of a nervous wreck. I think I hit it well, uh, and once I got up on stage yeah. and hit play, Things went to go. Things just went smoothly at that point. I, I think so. Um, uh, I got Fair a lot well. of positive feedback after the, the meeting, and a big weight off my shoulders afterwards. So I was mostly pleased with the interaction that I got with the people who had feedback with my presentation, and mm. um, so it was very encouraging. And I don't know if it, it, it created an opportunity for me to actually talk to more people than I normally would have because people were coming up and asking me questions about this, that, and the other. Sure. And we discovered some interesting things about our company. I mean, one of the, unbeknownst to me, even though I've been with DEA for seven, 18 years now, we were the first, or if not first, one of the first couple of uh, companies that operated a mobile LIDAR hmm. unit. And that was part of my presentation. We had this unit that we built with Regal with Jennifer and Ted before Topodot. And oh, wow. they, they were fully aware of this unit that we had. And it was like, oh, that's very, very interesting. So little Easter eggs that, that became uncovered yeah. throughout the process. So Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And all, right. all right, so so I have to ask, um, as the the resident non 
lifelong surveyor in the group. But you play Briefly. one on TV. I play one on TV, but can you just take a step back? Maybe maybe Jennifer can give me the elevator speech on what Topo Dot is and does and and maybe a little bit about what you guys think about how it makes it, you know, differentiate from from other products. Great transition, Sean. It's like you you didn't miss a beat. I know, right? You've been gone forever, right but in. yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Go ahead, Jennifer. So from one non-surveyor to another, um, <laughs> by the way, I, I like also, it. By, nice. all the way, nice. Jennifer, I, I also ha am a, by education, a mechanical engineer. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Um, so Tobodot is a high performance application for Bentley, um, the pl Bentley platform to bring in all of your point cloud information and related information, calibrated imagery, GPS information, points and all kinds of um, information like that and help you extract from this information, from these point clouds, your models. So your topography models, sur surface models, or even just do uh, data analysis directly on the data. So if you're doing monitoring of um, movement or floor flatness or pavement condition analysis, there is there are so many applications that you can um, perform on point clouds that, um, you know, we give you all the tools for, for you to use this information accordingly. And um, mm, okay. what's great is that you could bring any data. It doesn't even have to be LIDAR. It could be point clouds created from imagery or bathymetry. Uh, just as long as it's a point cloud, it can be used in total. So that's the elevator. Oh, I like it. I like it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Randy, do you want, anything, you want to add anything to that? No, she's, from your perspective, she's. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I've tried many, many softwares, and none of them, uh, you know, none of them uh, ever compared to Topodot. So just the ease, um, and I think that falls back to them listening to surveyors and trying to uh, develop the tools with surveyors in mind, so surveyors can naturally use the tool, just like they'd be using a tool in the in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Josh? I mean, pretty much piggy piggybacking on what they said, they took a, a they took a concept and added it to a product, which is the Bentley platform. Bentley being MicroStation, you know, it's a, it's a major CAD platform that more or less all Department of Transportation's use. And Bentley had some inherent tools that did some of the things with point clouds, but it was pretty clunky. Um, mm. And Topodot came in and they recognized kind of a, a market within there and made a high performance machine uh, that lives within Bentley. And they even take some of the regular tools that Bentley has that kind of are beyond point clouds and, and made them better as well. So uh, clearly it, it's, a, it's a program that's it's like a, it's like adding a turbo char charger onto a, onto a mm. car or something like mm. that. You know? and, uh, can't can't say enough about how how well the, the program performs and the ease of use of it is really quite incredible and in how uh, just uh, fluid it is and it's it's a pretty great program in my opinion hey geoholics quick shout out to monson engineering monson engineering is the leading supplier of surveying gis mapping scanning solution products for the design build industry in the intermountain west since 1974 Man. When were you born, Sean? <laughs> Not then. They provide cutting-edge design-build technologies and supplies, including Trimble GPS, Teledyne Optech 3D scanners, Spectre Precision Total Stations, Tiny Mobile Robots, Emicent Hover Map 3D scanners, DGI drones, Sokia levels, and Topcon lasers. These guys pride themselves in being your one-stop shop throughout all the phases of your project, planning to completion. From drones to lasers, total stations, or high-accuracy GPS equipment, they have what you need when you need it. To learn more, go to monsonengineering.com and be sure to let them know that Geohawk sent you for those deep, deep discounts. That's awesome. So the Topodot Love Fest is, has commenced. I mean, I, I get a, all the conferences that we go to, I always get a general Topo Dot Love Fest, but this is really a concentrated, it, it really is. Topo <laughs> dot orgy, it's almost, over, yeah, it's, it's a bit overwhelming. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it, um, 
there's competition out there, I'm sure. But I do have, even before I ask that question. So you mentioned that you know this is applicable to the Bentley platform. Is there anything on the Autodesk side that Topodot works with as well, or is it strictly Bentley? So for anybody that's tried to use Play Clouds in the Autodesk environment, you know that that's either very difficult or impossible. And it's not for lack of trying. Like we would be triple the size that we are if we had some tools in, in Autodesk. Uh, and gotcha. so there are limitations around it. Now, the good news is that everything that you create within the Bentley platform, because it's already a CAD environment, mm -hmm. is just transferable to Civil 3D or any other deliverable platform like RGIS or Carlson, wherever you need to go. Um, mm -hmm. So you're already in a CAD environment that is creating all this language for you that you can just save as a DXF or DWG and be at, in the Autodesk platform. So it's very gotcha. seamless to move from one to the other. So it shouldn't mm -hmm. be a problem. And I understand that a lot of people, you know, work within the Civil 3D or, or Autodesk environment and prefer to stay there. But once they see the potential of, uh, you know, not only improving their workflows, making more automated workflows, and just in general, uh, be, be more proficient, then mm -hmm. there is no discussion. So. Yeah, yeah. On that note, Randy, what makes Topodot unique? Oh, boy, that's a loaded question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to fall back to my department, the training and support. So it, it's the foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. You can build tools, but if you can't support them, or if you're a company that you know you, you accept a support ticket and then you don't know you won't answer it for two or three days, uh, you're leaving your clients behind. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know I think that's that's that, that's where they truly shine um, is is the training and support. Yeah. Now I want to add to to what Randy was saying there is that um, so. <clears throat> In a lot of ways, uh, one one side of our business is always being about what is the customer need. But sometimes you don't know what you need until okay. you know somebody comes up with it. Sure. So, what actually makes Topo that uh, mm -hmm. I think best for surveying and engineering applications is the way that we handle data or that it handles data. And uh, in that, the majority of the industry you try to clean up data. You have to classify, filter, remove noise from vehicles, vegetation, just to create a surface model. But then you start losing definition, it starts getting a little bit choppy because you have noise associated with obstruction, dirt, water, rain, people, all kinds of stuff. But instead of trying to clean up the data, what we do in Topo that is we, we do more statistical analysis of the data, eliminate error, and just look for signatures on the data. So what's what's unique about this feature that you're trying to extract? You're extracting a brake line. Okay, what does it look like? And is it even everywhere? And if so, can we automate this process? And so because of that, you have so much more room for um, automation, for quality in control over that process. And, and I think that what makes that what makes Tuba that very unique versus anything else out there. Yeah, Josh, I'm curious to get your perspective. What like what type of projects do you use Topodot for? So primarily, we use it for transportation projects. Um, I would say that's primarily because uh, that's the lion's share of the, the work that we go after. Uh, large transportation projects, miles and miles, highway corridors. Uh, but we also use it for regular small site topos when applicable. We use it for a lot of energy related work. We introduce bathymetry to it and use, you know, the collected bathymetry um, oh, wow. into into Topodot mm -hmm. um, as well. So uh, really everything that we do, any any potential job that we do, if we use a laser scanner or collect LIDAR or photogrammetry, we're going to use Topodot with it. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of the projects are not a lot. Some projects are so small that it doesn't make any sense, or it's just not necessary. We just do it the old-fashioned way. But um, we're trying to put a we're trying to put lidar and point clouds on every single project that we do because we realize the benefit and efficiencies that you can gain, gain out of it. So, but yeah, primarily it would be uh, transportation mapping. Yep. 
Yep, perfect. So at uh, at Tuck this last year, there was uh, a rollout, right, of a new tool, I guess, this ground extraction tool. Um, who wants to talk a little bit about that and tell us more? So, um, so we usually uh, unveil the latest release during Tuck and have our power users test it and, and do the guinea pigs, I guess. Um, and so uh, in this last talk, we unveiled the um, ground routine that uses AI for uh, surface modeling, for ground surface modeling. And um, it, what do you think, Randy? It was, it was great success because oh, a lot of times, well yes. Accepted. Very well accepted. It, it traditionally we never had to clean up data in order to create mm -hmm. a ground surface and the biggest difference uh, with this new tool is that you just don't need to create as many break lines uh, mm -hmm. it, it's it's very uh, good at detecting changes in elevation especially in areas where you have maybe a lot of rockous terrain like on a cliffside or a quarry or just natural um, natural changes in elevation. Traditionally, you have to create brake lines in those areas, but this will reduce the amount of brake lines that you have to do. And so because of that, it's a great um, tool in uh, for the UAV industry. Um, we've seen mm. the explosion of, uh, you know, the drone market using not just photogrammetry, but lighter, and, um, and it's being used quite widely. And so this will come in handy. I, I think it's, it's going to mm. be the tool to, to be. Yeah. So when you roll something new like that out, what does that do for you, Randy? Like that's something else that you need to support then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I think uh, several weeks after Tuck, uh, the uh, support tickets were coming in. Uh, people wanting uh, to know a little bit more about in-depth training on it and uh, understanding all the settings. Um, and some people actually, you know, could we add this? Could this be added? So well, both support and uh, enhancement requests come in. And, and, uh, yeah. It, I'm yeah. curious on how, how did it originate? Or was this one of those tools that was born out of necessity or you guys got tired of being asked about it? Or how did it... Did it go from a support idea that Randy kept? I'm sure it was a Randy in, you know, thing. Somehow it's got to be Randy. Was involved I, don't, in. I don't think I had anything to do with that one. <laughs> just, For some <laughs> reason, I find that hard. <laughs> I really find that hard to believe too. I, I, uh, I don't think I did. I, I, it didn't. It wasn't on uh, my I, my radar at the time. I don't think. Right. So, so in addition to Randy's requests, we do also <laughs> try to implement. <laughs> We uh, no, we have a roadmap for um, for in improving upon our, our secret sauce, I should say. So, so we have a pretty well established workflow, and a lot of people like that the way you know the the workflow it's, it's already um, established within the tool process. But um, so we're trying to take each tool at a time and improve it on its own, and it's been mm -hmm. happening for over two years or so. So uh, in, in this roadmap, it's, it's not just about, you know, what could be changed to this tool, but also how can we use technology? So like I said, this less tool is using AI to validate those points that are kind of, uh, you know, uncertain, right? And so it is automatically, it is it's training the process so that it recognizes and validates points before it gives you an output. In that way, the user doesn't have to do a lot of cleanup. They don't have to. Uh, they don't have a lot of false positives. It's just a lot more accurate. Um, so, so we're trying to integrate technology into the tools to just make them better. Real world, real real world application. Shortly after the conference, as I discovered the new AI tool, we quickly integrated it to a, a project where we're doing quantity surveying for a, a mine client of ours that produces silver. Um, and we were under accelerated time deliveries for these projects where they need, they were going to have to get the results more or less like the same day that we collected the data or the day after. Um, 
So right off the bat, I got the team together and said, hey, Topa Dot has got this new tool that should eliminate some of the pains that we, we struggle with um, with brake line generation, right? And or over, I guess, saturation of data into the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we reduced our point. I think we did an analysis of the way we normally did it uh, with a very tight mass grid of points and manual brake line extraction uh, versus the AI tool and compared our results. And we found that we got you know, nominal differences, uh, but the size reduction and time savings in it were uh, quite large. Um, so we, you know, we went with it, tested it, it proved itself, and now we implemented a system for every time we get this new layer of uh, quantity to survey. And it's sort of a systematic process now. You hit a couple of buttons, you, you kick it back to AutoCAD and generate some cut fill reports and some volume reports and send it off the client, and then we're done. So really cool timing couldn't have been more serendipitous it's like hitting the easy button it sounds like yeah Yeah. and i gotta i gotta interject a little bit and i'm curious what this group thinks we've talked about this before and it was i think we i can't remember how it came up but it was the question about okay so in the general business model you have a client you 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 know you fly something you have to generate some quantities that typically takes 12 hours at x fee or whatever right and then you say oh cool we got this great new feature that can i push a easy button and now i can get it to you in and out mm. and uh and in a consulting business is that uh an hours of time and it's cheaper or is that the same time or the same cost is just fat, like so she make more money uh well i mean that's why i want to ask this group and especially when you know it if you're on a time of materials or whatever type of project, yeah. Topo Dot makes it to where oh yeah, you don't need ten hours and four people to generate that quantity. You need an easy button and one guy in thirty minutes. Does your client expect uh, less of a fee <laughs> even when he's getting it faster? And how do you navigate through? You know, Jennifer and Randy are now taking uh, taking man hours away, and and does that still? You know where I'm going with this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you're right. If you yeah. if your business model is around man hours, then it's obviously going to affect it. But then you could you can um, you know make the case for do you, how, how much does it cost you if, or what does it cost you if you get this information sooner, right? Um, right. And so add value to the speed of your processing uh, in mm-hmm. your delivery. And I'm gonna let them speak, sir, because they have more more experience <laughs> on the business side, I guess, of the deliverables. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, what's the saying? Like, you're not paying me for the hour it takes me to do that task. You're paying me for the 30 years of experience. Well, that You know, you're paying for the result, however yeah. that happens, and yeah. I fe- yeah. you know. Yeah. How, is it really better the way we're doing things now with all the tech that we have, is it is it faster? Is it better? Well, yeah, it's faster, and I think it's better. Um, uh, in, in this particular instance, we're always going to strive to find a, a faster way t- to deliver things to our clients. And what we find is our clients just find more work for us to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. that's kind of where where it, it, it is evolving. I mean, you could you could have the same argument for say the advancement in GPS collection versus the old way of doing it with total station. Like, well, shoot, we can, we can map so much faster with GPS now, uh-huh. um, but are we just taking work away from ourselves? It really hasn't been the case. The work's still there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, what else? Did you have something else? No. Oh, you didn't? I thought you did. Another, uh, another right. thing on that too, that there is, you know, in a di- the only way we can use this awesome tool uh, that, that's provided from Topodot is by us also having a, a drone system and a LiDAR system and all these other things that we, we work into the contract. So it, it, it's, not, it's not exactly one for one. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Yep. There is a trade off. That, that easy that, button. There's right. a lot that goes into making the easy button give you what you exactly. need. It exactly. just doesn't populate itself. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. A lot of business models have, you know, changed with the introduction of ladder in the in, in the picture, right? Like you, mm-hmm. you used to have a larger um, team in the field collecting mm. 
mm -hmm. information. And now you yep. might only need to have one or two people in the field collecting, but it's it's, it's another technology. Now you're going to have a greater amount of information to process, whereas before you cat files would just pretty much auto-generate from the field information, right? Now you have a lot more data to process. So some schedules shift, but in general, you try to make things much faster so that you know you can turn around these projects a lot faster and that is valuable for the customer it, yeah. instead of waiting you know weeks to get a survey they can get mm -hmm. it in days or hours and okay. now that that can that has a value that you could you know use to increase your prices so instead of charging per hour now you're charging for that technology so mm -hmm. yep yep talk about some uh, maybe some unique use cases uh, that you're aware of that, you know, Topodot has played a huge role in. Like, for example, I know a good friend of the program, uh, Russ Hall. Oh, yeah. Um, he did, I think he did something with a F1 track in, in Miami or something like that. Is there, are, there, are there other examples or is that a really good example? I mean, the applications are infinite. And, and so one of that case is, is pretty special because, it, you know, to for somebody to rely on mobile mapping to build this this or to repay this track, uh, you know, you really have to have faith in the technology. And so mm, the fact that they could prove that they could not only uh, effectively use mobile mapping, but using Topodot's technology to evaluate the data, you have a lot more precision in the, in the results. It just it proves that you could use this type of information not only for surveying applications but engineering grade applications, and that's where we're really trying to take the tools to the next level. So, um, so the next level is really on the data analysis side. So, less and less modeling, less and less breakline extraction, surface modeling, and just directly using the point cloud. So, I've seen an tremendous uptake in the pavement condition analysis. So pavement okay. condition analysis for, for pavement rehabilitation projects. So let's say city, a town, a municipality needs to know where to allocate funds for pavement rehabilitation. They can, um, they can uh, you know, get a contract for a dedicated pavement system to collect information, but it's pretty expensive and they don't know where to really apply these the, or, or get the survey done because they cannot do it for the entire city or, or municipality. Whereas with mobile scanning, you could do it at a much cheaper price and just get just general information about the quality or the health of your network, the road network for the entire town, for example. And then you can apply, you know, uh, I want my uh, dedicated payment system to only do these roads and just give me a really good um, insight on, on how, um, you know, how, what's the quality of this data. So these are some of the applications where we're taking the technology um, you know, beyond the, the, just the topography models, the survey, sur surface creation mm -hmm. into more of the engineering grade uh, applications. And uh, so we're, you know, the, the applications are expanding, and um, you know that's that's uh, really where where we see it going. I am so excited to talk about Carlson Software. Founded in 1983, Carlson Software specializes in CAD design software, field data collection, and machine control products for the land surveying, civil engineering, construction, and mining industries worldwide, providing one source technology solutions from data collection to design to construction. Oh, yeah. Carlson Software's renowned dedication to customer service is unique in the industry. Their software suite is designed to complement land surveying operations and provides a variety of survey features to process data from surface modeling to least squares network adjustment. Users work seamlessly between the office and the field by utilizing company-wide design styles for ease of use and efficiency. And I can say, I have personally been using Carlson since 1991. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 1991? Yes. How is that possible? Oh, my God. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> time flies when you're having fun, that's for sure. But back in 1991, when I was introduced to Carlson, it was very apparent to me that their software products simply think like a surveyor. It's so easy to use. Their customer service is second to none. And uh, I actually went to Maysville, Kentucky for some training and played golf with Bruce and, uh, and his brother. 
Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. Nicest human beings on the planet. Um, highly recommend Carlson. To find out more, simply go to carlsonsw.com. Be sure to let them know the Geoholic sent you. Yeah. So what are the biggest challenges for you guys? Like, how do you keep up with, you know, this, the, the advancement of technology, the way we collect data is just it's changing all the time. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you guys keep up with that? So, um, <clears throat> keep it, keeping up pace with technology means, for, for example, I, I always look at batteries, right? Like systems get faster, bigger, better, and batteries are always lagging behind, right? Mm -hmm. So for hmm. us, it, Interesting. it's not necessarily in the amount of data, it's not necessarily uh, in the quality of data. It's a, I think it's in, in the automation processes and uh, just how you make somebody efficient at feature extraction, right? Um, and in a lot, of, a lot of times people just want to have the, the easy button, the modeling mm -hmm. button. But is that real, right? Like for somebody that has experience with processing data, they want to have control over the process. So we want to make people confident about what they're doing, giving them control over the process, but also make it so much easier and faster to do that they don't really have to, you know, make a lot of updates or changes. But the world out there is, you know, it's not perfect, right? Like, uh, we're going to have vegetation, we're going to have water, we're going to have all kinds of sources of noise. Even your site might be terrible, you know, like broken curves and, you know, just a mess of a site. So, you know, making tools that understand and recognize those challenges and help our users do better it's it's, yeah. it's where you know we see the challenges and i don't know if josh or, or randy want to say something about that well i'm yeah. curious from randy from sorry to interrupt josh but i'm curious from randy from a from a training and support side is it uh, the challenges that you may get is it because of the evolving technology and trying to keep the users updated with that or what um more um, on the problem side what do you see uh point cloud to point cloud uh, I think the technology to obtain that point cloud is changing uh, over time quicker and faster. Um, and, you know, but it is a point cloud inside of us. So uh, as far as us training the, the, the user on how to process that point cloud, uh, we're, we stay, you know, we stay up with it pretty well. Um, but yeah, I think it's more the hardware side that uh, is uh, the, the biggest challenge. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what we discover to it's it's the, the computers that we have the technology for collection of the data is advancing quicker than the computers that we have to process the data or at least how often we get these new computers um, that can you know meet the spec required um, you know computers are getting pretty expensive the company's not just going to get you a new computer every time you need it they've kind of got a system so um, that's been a bit of a hurdle um, for us, but, but we manage. Uh, data management is probably the, the biggest challenge that we have, just Interesting. being able to process it and, and use it. Well, I mean, that is a common, common. Go ahead, go ahead, Jennifer. I was going to mention, too, that another big, challenges, uh, another big challenge that we see in the industry is reusing this data. So you originally mm. collect this data for Project X, but it's got so much money value beyond that like maybe you collected it for a right away project but then you have this risk management team wanting to know if there is a crack on this building well you know just reusing this data and and being able to access it quickly and have uh multiple people you know be able to access that information is a it's another crucial point because we could be collecting um, massive amounts of data and store it in, it in the cloud but if you know why would you go and recollect this data if you already have it somewhere where you can use it? Um, so that's one of those things that we're just trying to um, not only help our customers, our Toba customers to organize and cat catalog their information, access it quickly from the cloud and whatnot, but also make it available to their customers. Let their not customers know what they have with this point cloud so that they can also get excited about the technology and start asking for more, you know. 
Well, that's the double-edged sword, right? It, you, it's the selling point of a point cloud, and you can scan everything and get all this data, but then you got to be able to do something with all that. And the first thing you want to do is strip it down so you can actually use it, mm -hmm. but then you don't get yeah. the multiple or the, the different uses and the different clients that might need it. Uh, it, is a, it is a very common question that comes up on the show a lot, and, mm -hmm. and I think we just really touched on it, but just to see if you guys' thoughts. What do you think is advancing faster? What's lagging behind? Is it the uh, hardware or the software side? Uh, another I'm not talking to two people that are on the software side, but I'm just curious. <laughs> another unique thing that I, I run into often, and I ran into it today, was um, the integration of point clouds and how they how they relate to standards that have been de developed um, mm. over you know over the years years ago. That don't really account for for point clouds. There, there's a lot of uh, DOT standards out there that have a, a way of doing things that's more akin to the traditional form of serving. And now we got point clouds, and we're we're collecting data differently than being out there on the road with a with a prism pole and, and a, you know a total station getting a shot that Jennifer yep. alluded to earlier, where you kind of get this this point file that's already ready to go. Uh, now we're we're extracting it from CAD. How do we get that to mirror the standard that they want? Uh, a lot of times it's, it, frankly, maybe unnecessary to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you still have to do it because it's their standard. And I, a lot of DOTs are, are playing catch up to how to, uh, how to develop standards around the new technology. Because sure. you can imagine a DOT spent a lot of effort into developing those standards. And they're not just going to up and change them every time technology advances. So that's another thing. Yeah, and, and when you're thinking about, I think what, what I relate that to is if you're looking at, say, just like a standard slope of a road, you know, the standard's going to be you have to have 10 shots along that, and each 10 shot has to meet the minimum slope. Yeah. Well, in a point cloud, you have an infinite amount of slopes on that same section. <laughs> That's and a not million really, shots. And a million it. shots. Right. So if you really looked hard enough, you could find one section that doesn't yeah. meet, then you're kind of working backwards there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good point, Josh. I'll tell you what, those uh, those DEA folks, they're thinking they on really it, man. know their stuff, <laughs> right? I don't know what's in the water over there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I do know when it's in the water, and it's beer, but it's still. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So, like, what are you guys excited about moving forward? I mean, what do you, what do you see? What's, what's coming up next? What's the next big technical... Uh, advancement that uh you know topo dot can be a part of or what's the what's the next easy button yeah so can't tell um, us i know i know it's secret i know you show up not top 24. Easy, not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well yes yeah. i i i should see you at top 24 but really it just it's it goes back to what i was just saying about uh sharing the the, the data being able to access it um and understand what it does so um, one thing about <clears throat> one thing about this digital twin reality capture world mm. that we're living in, um, it's about not just modeling everything, right? Like you don't, you could spend a long time trying to extract every little thing about your point cloud, or just kind of like assuming that your point cloud has everything, which is neither is the answer. The answer is really knowing what you have on your point cloud and extract it whenever you need it so mm -hmm. that it's not you know it, it, it's not taking you a long time to model it but it's also just achieving the the means when you need it uh for just what you need and so um that's i guess is the next big hurdle and it's it's mm -hmm. letting people know that it's not just Yes, we want surveyors to have access to the data because nobody knows the data better than the geospatial analyst, right? Like not everybody has to handle a point cloud. You don't want your engineering team creating, you know, elevations and things like that because, you know, the, they don't really understand the where error creeps from or et cetera, right? Like you want that geospatial analyst, that surveyor to, that understands the data best and understands the tool best to have access to that, to create those elevations, those clearances, those measurements. Uh, but but have that engineering uh, or designing team understand what point plans can do so that they can request those kinds of uh, deliverables and, and get more out of your, your their data. So that's, I think, our best, our next challenge. In addition to 
you know, taking care of uh, the next Randy uh, support <laughs> requests, right? There is no, there is no Randy. Randy. There is there no, is no Randy. Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm what I'm hearing is the way to get a job at Topodot is just send in a gazillion oh, questions yeah, and a yeah. gazillion no, no. requests. Just be oh. the biggest pain in the ass, and <laughs> you, it'll work out for you. You'll go you're, you'll go to the sp- spam filter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Randy, you were kind of shaking your head while uh, Jennifer was talking there. What do you want to add to that? No, I think she's 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 exactly right. We're 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 trying to uh, you know uh, do we want to. Plug in Topo Share here a little bit. Ooh, Jennifer. that's a yeah. new name. What do you got uh, there? I mean, I mean, it's it's it used to be Topo Cloud, and now it's Topo. Or it's been Topo Share for a while. Uh, you know, everyone has a basic version of it included in their their license, so uh, companies can be uh, storing on the cloud and giving access to internal uh, internally mm. the, the uh, your, their technicians uh, faster and quicker uh, at a, and more organized more organized cheaper mm. yeah so uh it's de- but uh, we're you know we're pushing i'll just let jennifer take over she no that's, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't, I, no. I don't want to say no, i don't want to say too job. much i don't want to say too much I, no no it, it is yeah. a product it is yeah. a product anybody yeah. can access it right now like yeah, you, yeah. If we have uh we have a, a a lot of um, a lot of our clients are already using Topo Share. So, it, like Brandy said, it's part of the Topo license. And this is one other great thing about Topo Everything that we just mentioned, everything that we've been talking about, it, all the tools for roadway, rail, power lines, oil and gas, construction, indoor applications, everything is included in your Topo. Yeah. So yeah. there are no like different modules or whatnot. So mm-hmm. a lot of people are already using Topo Share to organize their data and access it quickly. So, for example, we have teams that are, you know, organizations that are international. Jacobs is one of them uh, that have offices here in Denver and Australia, and they share data, you know, uh, across, uh, you know, the world. And ha- being able to access it directly into Topo, that is one thing. Now, Topo Share Enterprise is basically where we allow the customer have access to that and just visualize what they have um, and what they can do with that data. And it's on a web platform. So no, they don't have to have Topo, they don't have to have MicroStation or anything at all. They just can access the a web, uh, a web uh, link where they can see their project, they can see the extent of their data. It's a viewer, um, they can see their pictures, they can see the extracted line work in everything that, you know, attributes and all kinds of information and it's very cheap i was gonna say Mm. (laughs) it's very inexpensive so this is something that you can already offer exactly so it doesn't it doesn't you don't have to spend you know too much trying to create a 3d point cloud v you know viewer this is Mm. just the easy way to share that information so Topo share. Yeah, I, Topo share. I can provide a use case example on on Topo share, although we still have, haven't really integrated integrated it to our, our day to day. But we really need to push that envelope a little bit more. But we had a project that was for 20 miles of data, and we had staff working uh, from California, Oregon, Idaho, and Washington, and Colorado um, on this project. So how do you how do you assign that to the individuals working on that? How do you manage that? And it was so nice. To Here's a here's a, a, a Google Earth type image with tiles, and, the, and okay, this is segment one, Colorado person. You're gonna you do that one, and he goes there and he clicks it, and downloads his portion of data, and he goes to work. Yeah. Um, and it's just you know, as opposed to trying to figure out who's working on what manually uh, in a non geospatial look. Um, yeah. It just sort of oh I know these file types are here I need you to download this this file yeah. it was probably twice as big as you need or maybe not yeah. enough or you know or have to or have to send them a hard drive because they don't have right, right. The internet yeah it's been there done that exactly so in that sense it's it's incredibly powerful um, and also even as a database for your data with the attributes and information you can tag onto it really can solve a lot of uh, storage issues and uh, yeah filing issues. Yeah, yeah, I know that's good stuff. So, what what is the business model? Is it a subscription based thing? I mean, do you have licenses? What does it look like if you're a, if you're a five person company or you're a five thousand person company? How, yeah. how how would you describe that? 
that's the best part because you know it doesn't matter if you're a one person company or, or you know a thousand person company it's just uh, anybody can access Sokodot because it's a perpetual license so once you buy okay. the amount of days and you buy days so um, okay. when when you when you buy your pool of days you can install in as many computers as you want and like I said mm -hmm. organizations like David Evans who has been a client from the day one um, it, you know they only have one license but they install in our, all their many offices and so uh, when they have a lot of projects they use it a lot and they can expand their organizations and when they're not using it they're not paying for additional licenses that they're not scalable. using right? it's yeah. a scalable it's very scalable. Yeah, it. so we've for, seen for, a lot yeah. of growth in uh, for smaller companies that get they invest in this technology mm -hmm. be able to grow because they're not spending a lot in the software side but it's really the key to unlock the power of your point cloud data the mm -hmm. the lidar data it's a lot easier for a company to um, to look at a per use base fee than it is to purchase a large fee for perpetual use mm -hmm. um, I know that for a fact uh, there's other software out there that, that has some extraction capabilities and you know a license is as much as twelve thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars yeah it's perpetual there's still maintenance things that come along with it but um, that's a hard pill to swallow especially if you're a smaller company but even a larger company like like ours it's, it's like, well, we already got five of those. Are we really going to justify getting one more unless we know exactly how often we're going to use mm -hmm. it? Or, or, you know, yeah. and we, yeah. we, we have a product like that, and we've, we've danced around getting another license for it for a couple of years now. We've never been able to successfully decide to pull the trigger on it, whereas with TopoDot, it's a, that's a non-factor. Yep. Right. Yep. And, and awesome. there is a, a maintenance associated with TopoDot, too, mm -hmm. but it's only based on usage. So you, yep. it's really easy to budget it because mm -hmm. you just open Topodot, you say project X, then you get a report project X, use five <laughs> days of Topodot, and then you just put it as part of the budget of the project. At the end of the year, we tell you, you use, you know, a hundred days of your, of your license and uh, it's not a surprise, you know? And so mm -hmm. this maintenance provides you with the training, with the customer support, the updates, and so you never really have to have budget, extra budget for training or for um, you know any other service work. It's included in in the maintenance, and and I think that's what has allowed a lot of especially smaller businesses flourish because it's just not overly expensive. You know. Yeah, I mean it's genius. Actually, it's a win-win. That uh, I'm love gonna it. plug my boss there. Ted, yeah. It's all Ted Mac. <laughs> You know, and he was yeah. he he was a, a guest of the show too. I think episode the best. eighty something. Yeah. yeah. Yep, friend of the program, no doubt about it. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. Um, what else? What else do you want to talk about before we uh, let you all get out of here? Like, what are you guys excited about in the in the future? I know you already shared a little bit, but what's uh what what drives you and what are you excited about? Um. <laughs> My, my presentation last year at Tech was called Moving at the Speed of LiDAR, and it sort of chronicled um, where LiDAR started, you know, and, and where is it going. It, there's a, a saying floater, floating around on the internet as a meme, like, how it started versus how it's going. Probably all seen that before. And what excites me is where it's going, because it's literally entering the realm of science fiction. Uh, <laughs> We have no idea what's going to happen next. It's getting yeah. smaller, it's getting faster, and it's capturing more data at a, uh, at a more affordable rate. Uh, I, I, I can imagine a scenario where there is continuous LiDAR mapping of large urban areas at all times for monitoring of a number of things. I mean, geo-automation is a, is a thing, um, you know, all these automated uh, vehicles are using some yeah. forms of LIDAR to keep themselves going. Um, but yeah, it's it's the future. I mean, I think back to when I, my first day on the on the survey crew, it's like, party chief told me to start digging a hole right here. And I'm, I don't know what I'm even digging for. I'm just digging a hole. Digging and digging and digging. And I find it's some rebar out there. And I have no idea what I'm doing. And like, I can't even fathom 
you know, <laughs> what, what on, you know, a, a flying drone with a, with a lidar sensor on it. Uh, you know, from then to now, it's it's just it's it's really cool. Um, and the technology is fun. It, it's interesting, uh, and it continues to become more and more interesting while challenging. Yeah. Changing all the time. Well, let's talk yep. about that just just for a second. Uh, <laughs> uh, we talked about get kids in the survey and you talked about making you know the fun parts of what this is. Mm -hmm. uh, how is Topo Dot connected with uh, that organization, and what are you guys doing to spread awareness for well, you know the geospatial community in general? So that's actually what I'm personally more excited about. Um, so I know that the technology side is, is being well taken care of by the rest of my team and uh, my personal challenge is expanding the boundaries of, of the industry. And so uh, there are two, two things that I'm focusing on and one is get kids into surveying. We, you know, we're very good friends with Elaine Ball and um, in her organization and so they're gonna be a big part of talk 24 fyi mm -hmm. i'm not gonna say anymore but they're gonna be there we're Ooh. gonna have yeah we're gonna have a really cool event uh with kids <laughs> and we're gonna have um we're working on the more interactive uh i guess the an interactive um feature that is not going to be a poster or a comic book, but it's going to uh, promote how do you become a surveyor? What are the steps to take from, you know, a high school or element or even like just school in general up to becoming a surveyor? So that is going to be our, our goal for Talk 24 with Get Kids a Survey and hopefully promote that around, uh, you know, all the kids that have access to this information. But um, and then second, my other challenge is to expand uh, the use of this technology everywhere else in the world. So uh, America, United States has always been at the forefront of this technology where we're not only implementing, we're always coming up with new, new uh, technology, new ways of doing it better in the rest of the world is catching up. So we have a great uptake in, in Europe as far as mobile, uh, mobile scanning goes, and it's, it's just flourishing, right? But uh, I know um, South America and other places in the world are, are you, know, you know, just getting into the technology. So um, taking advantage that I speak Spanish and that I like what bunny, I want to go <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and work South America, Central America mm -hmm. a little bit more in the next couple of years and see how we can expand the boundaries of, awesome. of the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we recently had FIG, the International uh, Surveyors oh, yeah. Conference here in Orlando, yeah. and that was just an eye opener for me and just, just to see the potential that we have, uh, you know, to expand this technology, especially in the Americas. Yeah, so, that's awesome, yeah. Jennifer. You need to get you need to get Bad Bunny at uh, Talk Twenty Four. <laughs> oh my god! Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> that's what she's excited about. <laughs> uh, what, what about you, Randy? Uh, my current project uh, that I'm probably most excited about is the reason I, I really signed on board was uh, um, Tobot University is our online platform for our users. Mm, so nice. Um, it had a ton of information. But just over the years, um, it's just kind of uh, been on the back burner uh, as the people were busy in other things. Uh, it didn't get the love and the TLC that it really deserved. So uh, we're recreating that experience. Uh, and I know that made Jen sad. I do apologize. Uh, but uh, our goal is to make it more user friendly, a more dynamic online self-paced environment with, uh, you know, short videos uh, of our tools uh, and really um, uh, have more uh, more content uh, for, for our users uh, to uh, be more in-depth training on our, our tools. So that's that's my current uh, project. Love it. It's awesome. Before we let Josh go, um, so who's got the better beard? Josh or 
Brandon Montero <laughs> survey Jesus. Ooh. Ooh, it's a close one. It's a close yeah, one. Yeah, I'm gonna have to lean on Josh though. That, I'm yeah. It's I'm yeah. a little partial. Yeah. That is pretty yeah. strong. I feel yeah. good about that because I did a beard competition last week and I didn't even get in the top three. Man, uh, uh, what? <laughs> yeah. What do they know? What I did do they know? A little bit late. Yeah, but anyways, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, before you let you guys go, um, I do have a question I always ask everybody. Um, so with the three of you, it'll be kind of whoever wants to chime in. But uh, mm -hmm. I ask everybody, uh, do you have a mantra that you live by? Jennifer, I'll let you start. <laughs> Since you seem very okay. eager to talk. <laughs> She's got one. She's got one. <laughs> Uh, so I don't have a mantra. Well, I have mantras to live, but tr since this is a business call, I guess, uh, the mantra that I live by in two for that is data quality drives automation. Uh, everybody mm, just wants like the automatic tools, but do you have the data quality? So yeah. data mm. quality drives I'm gonna automation. use that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I pretty generic. I mean, say a lot of these been something I have sort of. <laughs> carried with me throughout my my life um but yeah i mean work work wise it's like never stop learning uh that's a that's a big one just keep keep going mm. keep going keep going so yeah, love it love works for me that's that's my yeah. life C -L -L -E. right C -L -L -E. you only live once enjoy it you only live once awesome. love it yeah you know. what you got randy uh adapt and conquer Mm -hmm. All right. When you when something is presented to you, a challenge, you just gotta adapt and conquer. Uh, find a solution, move forward. I like that. I I thought he was gonna go with the uh, persistence pays off kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Make it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, make it till you make it. <laughs> now, Jennifer. <laughs> Oh, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, thank you, guys. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Love mm -hmm. TopoDot. You know, they've been involved with uh, the Geoholics since day one, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. can't thank you all enough. And Josh, thanks for being a part of this as well and providing the user perspective. And uh, yeah. here we go. Yeah, here we go. We're on our way out here. Bad Bunny, adding value and making friends. <laughs> if anyone would like to be a guest on a future show, or if you have any topical ideas, shoot us an email at info at the I is think that, is that topical or to topo? <laughs> How's that? Oh, I like what you did there. there huh? I like yeah. what you did there. I believe we're booking into October, so give us a shout yeah. if you like it on the show. Yeah. Bad Bunny, how do you say that? Des de la playa. Oh, like, something you about the beach. I don't know. Yeah, something about the beach. Until next time, everyone. Data quality drives automation. I like that. Thanks for being a friend of the program, TopoDot. Love you guys. See you at Tuck24. Adapt and conquer. Say la vie. Say la vie. Most importantly, be safe and healthy, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.